So this paper was published in 2006, right? And I, I wonder whether any of the authors of this paper <laughs> is in the room. All right, so this was a really, uh, I guess, the significant event in our field that there were a group of global researchers got together and they put this position paper that learning will be different with the introduction of mobile learning. And this is the part of the paper and we can look at how they initially define seamless learning. And here is the definition. And you can catch that the key idea is that now learners can switch between uh, different scenarios. But how do they switch? It's through the mediation of mobile devices. Another part that I think is very important is the, the concept of seamless learning space. Okay, space is not really physical space here, but it's out of learning, out of school environment, and you can learn anytime when you are very curious about it. Of course, this is possible because you have your personal devices. So what is the key contribution of this seamless learning? For me, my perspective is that it really has helped us understand the emergent learning opportunities, right? And the scenarios outside of formal learning context. But we can also question ourselves as a research community, whether we really have realized the promises of seamless learning. Uh, mobile learning really transform our teaching and learning culture beyond easy access, right? You may have your answer, all right? But one thing I, I'm pretty sure, yeah, what happened for the past decade is mobile learning has become really intelligent. So we have witnessed uh, intelligent data-driven movement in education, and this is taken from this year's Horizon report. Uh, it predicts the key trends in teaching and learning of higher education. And as you can see, AI, was features as one of uh, two, two in two themes out of six. AI for learning analytics, AI for learning tools. But in the academic discourse, right? As I say before, whether this data-driven approach have really transformed our teaching and learning practices, I can see two perspectives. One is very optimistic view that, okay, with the, the use of data or AI, AI, there is a possibility of human-machine collaboration because machines can augment human abilities. On the other hand, there's also a skeptical view saying the danger of technological fix and also highlight the complexity of solving learning problems with AI. So let's talk about mobile learning. Uh, here, mobile learning, I also include uh, online learning as well. All right, and then the movement to integrate learner data. So I'm going to talk about these three projects that I tried to integrate learner data in mobile or online learning. And also I like to share with you that I wasn't trained to deal with learner data, uh, like uh, many of uh, you in the room or uh, online. So it was a lot of learning uh, process for me as well. Also, I found a lot of challenges and opportunities along the way as well. So the first project is about um, whether mobile learning really becomes more intelligent, okay, as a background. The second research is I try to uh, develop recommendation system, but recommendation system that may, students may not like it, may not prefer. And the third project is whether we can help the students to feel less negative emotions in online learning. Here is the first research project about mobile learning and AI. All right, so the rise of intelligent mobile apps in these days is not so difficult to see mobile apps that claim to have AI functions. Uh, this is a Santa Toic, it's one of the very uh, popular mobile apps in Korea. And then this, uh, app, the mobile app, if you go to their homepage, they claim that you can invest 20 hours and that you can increase 165 points in your TOEIC test. This is huge uh, improvement. And if you're a student, you are very tempting to buy this one. And on the screen, uh, you can see that every function they have, they highlight AI functions. So 
my team really want to find out whether these uh, mobile learning apps that claim to have AI functions are really intelligent. So uh, we analyze uh, 51 mobile language applications that claim to have AI functions. And of course, for the analysis, we needed to have a framework. And uh, luckily, we found this very nice framework from the HCI research. Uh, which I really recommend you to read if you have a chance. So this, uh, this paper proposed AI design complexity map, and then the, the design of AI applications or platforms. So they propose to, uh, they propose two by two. So there are four dimensions here based on uh, systems capability. It could be very fixed or it can be keep evolving with data or in terms of systems output, it can be very fixed like a binary, or it can be adaptive with, uh, again, through the machine, machine learning, uh, machine keep learning with the data and, and it can be very adaptive. So level four is the highest. So it means the system is very complex, keep evolving. So what we find out from this research, many of the lab apps that we analyze belong to level one and level two, three low levels of design complexity. Most common pattern was again, like uh, answering questions and the AI provide correct answers, right? This is very common pattern. And I like to also uh, introduce this concept of uh, learning paradigms in uh, AI in education. And uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, was pr uh, proposed by uh, scholars in China, and they say there are three paradigms of AI ED. The first paradigm is AI is directing, and learner is just a mere recipient. Second paradigm is AI supporting, and learner is a collaborator. The third paradigm is AI is empowering, so learner is, becomes a leader. And it kind of mirrors uh, the development of learning theories as well. So for, uh, from behaviorism all the way, constructivism or connectivism. Of course, my research kind of confirmed that many of the AI applications that we can see in education still remain in paradigm one. And this is not the first time that we see in the history of uh, education and game design, we already seen this pattern. Early design of uh, education and games was like this, right? As uh, says a uh, math blaster. And then uh, what learners have to do is just answering to this math question and they got the points. Very behavioristic kind of learning mechanism. And also we have seen this Baptist brain, uh, which I really like as an example. So they introduced this teachable agent. So when we learn uh, most is, is, we learn most when we teach someone. So we, you have this uh, agent uh, called Betty, and then you have to teach her about very complex science concepts. By doing so, you learn a lot through the, uh, along the way. This is more like a, a paradigm two or paradigm three kind of design. Also, I found that from that project, we have uh, AI is really the function of two, uh, two sciences. The first is kind of the data science part, right? This is the part that we cannot really see, but this is the layer very important in any AI applications. And another layer is design science. This is the part that we see and we interact. And someone like me trained in education technology only focus on this design science part, the layer that we can see and we can interact. But through this project, I found that we really need to know another layer, which is data science. The reason is design is never neutral. The way you design is really driven by the mechanism that you have for data and also a certain orientation to certain paradigm as well. So I tried to move from design science to data science. And also it was a very challenging part. This comes to my second uh, research project. 
So this is a recommendation system, and we try to develop the recommendation system that students may not like. Uh, you will know why we did that. Again, we have seen the rise of educational mobile apps in the market. But from consumer's perspective or learner's perspective, more is not necessarily better because you tend to have a difficulty choose the one that you, that you may like or it may be relevant to you. Therefore, we incline to follow recommendations. Those of you coming from coming, uh, computer science background, you probably know all these kind of techniques for the recommendation systems, like uh, collaborative filtering, content-based filtering, and hy hybrid method as well. So basically how they recommend is based on your preference, right? Because you bought this item, therefore they recommend the item with a similar logo, all right? Also, these two people watch the same video, therefore, the movie that she watch, uh, uh, that uh, watched by her can be recommended to this guy as well. So this is a very simple way to explain uh, the recommendation system. But in education, because we are always lack of data, we often have this cold start problem. And also another problem that I found is that most recommendations are based on preferences or similarities and the past data. And I kind of question whether that is the right way to do. The reason is, again, I uh, happened to attend this uh, lecture by Stuart uh, Russell. Uh, I think many of you know him as a guru in AI. And he has this wonderful book. Through the lecture, I got a lot of uh, very interesting ideas. But one of the ideas that I got from his lecture is that machines kind of learn how human behave and then also kind of change the algorithm so we can be more predictable. Also, he kind of questioned what is preference. And in fact, he defines preference as what is the future that we want. So escaping from our past and what is the future that we, we really want to have. It kind of, uh, uh, it, it is, it, it, it is very consistent with the view that we have about very situational uh, uh, learning perspective because we, we think it's very important to have learners agency and control, right? Why my future have to be determined by my past data? Another thing is we also value discovery learning, all right? So algorithms need to allow learners to discover something uh, that students may not experience before. Right, And I also found this another very interesting concept, long tail recommendation. Again, the common method of recommending items is always through this way, through popular items. So many of the items in the long tail, you know, may, maybe these items will never get, have a chance to be recommended, right? Because you only recommend popular items. So uh, I have this research idea. Perhaps we need a recommendation with more diversity. Of course, how to define diversity is a very challenging issue. So we try to define diversity in two ways. Diversity in learning styles, how we learn, and diversity in achievement goals, why we want to learn. And for the structure, how we learn, we, I, uh, we took this uh, framework, uh, Felder and Silverman's learning style model. Of course, we know the criticism behind this model, but uh, at least for the initial um, uh, model building, we need some kind of structure. So that's why we try, we decide to adopt this model. Uh, about the second dimension, why people want to learn. Uh, again, this is the framework that we use. Uh, this is achievement goal framework proposed by these scholars. Basically, again, this look at two by two, there are four dimensions, why we want to learn something. It could be uh, for the mastery or because you want to perform better than others. Yeah, so there are many reasons that why we want to learn. So this, through this uh, framework, we try to classify learners uh, in different ways. And this is the method that we went through to develop the learner models. 
uh, I will try, I will skip some of the details of the model uh, building process. And uh, you can refer to this article that we uh, uh, presented at EDM conference this year. So through this process, we built a learner model. And then uh, we, the last step was we tried to uh, test the performance of our proposed recommendation system. So group one received the traditional, more similarity-based recommendation. And then group two received the recommendation with more diversity. That means uh, it, it may not be the application that you prefer before. So we try to introduce novelty effect in the recommendation. Again, uh, this, okay, this is the result of our uh, performance uh, test. So we use RMSE uh, to evaluate the performance of our proposed recommendation system based on diversity. And because this is error, so lower is better. So recommendation system with a similarity, this is the traditional one. Recommendation system with diversity is the one that we propose. Also, we compare it with a random recommendation as well. So as you can see from here, the scores are like this. So what is the best performing? Still, the traditional way, based on the similarity, performed better. That means you sense like it, like that kind of recommendation. Diversity did also pretty well from my perspective. Of course, it was much better than getting the random recommendation. Also, I happen to talk to people uh, who, who knows this kind of algorithm a lot, and then they proposed that I should try reinforcement learning mechanism so I can find out the optimal level of using both similarity and uh, diversity in the recommendation uh, system. Also, we have a, a project. Uh, in this project, we also try to incorporate more, more learner-related variables in the prediction. So we have uh, different types of learner-related variables and calculated which one is more important than others. And this was presented at ICC this year. I think it was presented at one of the post sessions this week. This is the last project I want to share is effective feedback how we can have learners feel less negative emotions in online learning context. Okay, probably this is not, too, not new to many of us, right? We tend to get very distracted uh, when we, uh, you know, on, on, uh, online, and the many of our students may do this, right, behind the scene. The reason why they do is they cannot really focus, you know, they are not really engaged, right? And they also they may feel very negative emotions in online learning situations. How we know they are not really engaged, right? Is through we only see this part, right? So we really have to look at their faces, right? Face tell you something how they feel, right? So uh, I I show you different uh, images, and you you can try to guess what each image, what kind of emotion each image indicate. Right, she is smiling. All right, and yeah, and then yeah, this guy, and you know, try to think about it. Right. All right. So, of course, the first lady, she's very happy. I so go back and come back so you can see the things. Yeah. yeah. And all right, and then yeah, okay, yeah, this one. So this is how we categorize the different types of emotions. You uh, you probably try to look at their facial expressions. So there is a framework to analyze the emotions through facial expressions. The traditional way of analyzing emotions is through the indicators that we can capture from through a facial like a muscle movement. And this is one of the classic uh, framework uh, called FACT, uh, Facial Action Coding Systems by Ekman. So Ekman already established this uh, framework uh, consists of, I think, over 40 action units. So every 
This is AU1. Yeah, so he has already classified action units based on the very micro analysis of facial uh, muscle movement. And also these days we see uh, many effective computing platforms and these platforms automatically analyze people's emotions and the engagement levels and that they provide prompt. For example, you get a prompt when you are distracted, when you are driving. And also this is a framework uh, used uh, in, in academic emotions because academic emotions are a little bit different from general emotions or basic emotions that we talk about in other field. Academic emotions are types of emotions that directly tie to uh, learning activities or learning achievement. And again, you can see from here that they try to kind of divide which one is positive and which one is negative. Of course, happy is positive side and sad, angry and tired or is on the negative side. But initial phase of this research project, I was very naive and I thought that maybe I can use this kind of effective computing program and that I can uh, easily analyze the students' emotions and I can do something for them. But I found that this is not really true. There are many reasons why we cannot use this kind of commercial programs, at least from my perspective. The first reason is learning is very difficult to classify whether it's positive or negative because we do need some negative emotions along the way. For example, sometimes we need uh, some kind of anxiety or confusion, and they may be also very helpful to learning or learning achievement. And also these commercial uh, effective computing programs are based on commercial data. And so they are not really reflecting learning situations. So therefore, I tried to do my own classification. And also I found that there are two research gaps. The first research gap is the existing research on learner emotions are mostly based on very cognitively demanding problem solving situations like auto tutor. But the situation that I want to focus is more on like online video based learning, right? Where learners are kind of passive and watching the video lecture. And the second research gap I have is most research was done with Western learners. Therefore, I'll kind of question whether we can uh, transfer or generalize their findings to Asian learners. Of course, emotions considered to be quite universal, but I also think that some parts are quite cultural uh, or uh, situational, situational as well. But again, uh, I there another hurdle that I have is which emotions that I have to detect and intervene or design because there are so many types of emotions out there. This research was very helpful for me to understand the mechanism of how emotions flow from engagement all the way to disengagement, how learners feel, right? And then you can uh, try to look at how this was uh, visualized. And I can draw the line from here. And then probably this is the part that we have to do something about it. When they start to feel confused or frustrated, and at the end, they become really bored. And uh, I think uh, Professor Lion Baker was one of the keynote speakers uh, this year. And this article also gave me a lot of ideas. He claimed that it's better to be frustrated than bored. And that we need to do something for the students so they don't fall into the vicious cycle they, uh, where they remain bored for a long time. So my research question was really how we can detect this confusion, frustration, and boredom. And then whether we, there are certain like AUs and action units that we can detect from facial expressions. This is the research that we did with the Korean students adult learners, and then the whole process has been already uh, published in this article. So I, uh, I encourage you to refer to the, this article for the details of the method. And then this is the, um, this is the uh, video lecture they watch and they basically we recorded all learners' facial expressions and they tried to analyze them through facts. And this is the framework 
uh, the action units that we use for the analysis. So what we find out from this experiment, that there were a number of occurrences of uh, so-called negative emotions. So I focus on three emotions, right? Uh, confusion, frustration, and boredom. You can guess what was the highest, uh, 100 incidences, right? And what was the least? So we had, uh, we found that 101 boredom and the 82 incidences of confusion and the frustration was 62. And through this research, we also found that uh, there are certain AUs were, uh, were uh, significantly co correlated with a certain affective status. For example, boredom, we can pretty much indicate through this kind of AUs. So comparing our research findings with the previous uh, research, Okay, confusion and frustration, the, the AUs that we found are quite consistent with the previous studies. So in a way that we can assume that these indicators are quite universal across different uh, cultures. Boredom, on the other hand, Western learners, I think many researchers say that it's very hard to detect, but uh, surprisingly we found that there are clear AUs that we can detect and that these AUs have a strong correlations. And again, uh, as, as a, someone working in the design science, we have to think about it, why they feel uh, so, many, you know, so many occurrences of boredom or confusion and frustration. Of course, the first reason is the presentation styles. The lecturers are kind of boring you know, when she delivered the lecture. But another thing I found very important is this uh, two points. Maybe they don't have a strong intention why they have to learn this. Also, there's no feedback given during the learning process. So I did this follow-up study uh, that we tried to intervene uh, online learners. So we designed this intervention called utility value intervention. There's a whole concept about utility value intervention if you refer to educational psychology literature. Basically, utility value is uh, this framework here. It's here. So you need to have the utility value for your life, for your jo job or school or for the society. And then, you establish the relevance of learning, and then you can feel the learning process is relevant and you are more motivated and engaged. That's the very simple idea behind utility value intervention. But how we can make learners feel the relevance of learning? Uh, many researchers try UV essay writing. That means we, we ask them to write about this topic before they start their learning process. Another way that we can do is we try to remind utility value as a feedback during the learning process. So that's what we did. So we have three groups, control and UV feedback only group, and also a group did both writing and also receive feedback during the learning process. Again, this was published in the, in the, in, in the conference, learning science conference this year. So if you're interested, you can refer to this, this article. Okay, so this comes to my last part. Okay, I'm trying to, <laughs> am I still on time? <laughs> yeah, so the challenges I found along the way. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, now I think as a community, uh, we really need to know both design science and data science. Some of you may be more trained in the design science side than data science. But I found that probably this is very challenging time, but we have to know the language from both communities. Also, we need to have uh, access to quality learner data because the, the comment uh, feedback I always got when I submit the paper is, oh, your sample size is so small because my sample size is about 100. It's never strong for, uh, for very robust uh, learner modeling process. Also, I like to emphasize that as an Asian community, we need to build more Asian learner models. Many of the research out there is based on Western learners and to what extent learning is universal or cultural specific. I think this is the one question we have to answer as a community. 
But along the way, I also found a lot of opportunities. I really found that convergence in research is really happening. And it's really important to collaborate and it's a team. Because the, the last two research, right, the recommendation system and effective feedback mechanism, I had to collaborate with someone from computer science background. And they really contribute a lot to my research or, or our research, right? So we've been talking about cross, crossing boundaries for a long time. I think this is the time that we really have to cross our boundaries and beyond the comfort zone of our research. So during, um, I'm, I'm having my sabbatical this year, so I tried to cross the boundary. <laughs> so uh, I think it was it was June or July. I attended Education Data Mining Conference. This is not a community research community I never associate myself with, but I tried to cross the boundary. Uh, am I comfortable to enter the boundary or enter the new research community? Initially, no. But I found that it was very exciting as well. And I learned a lot, their language, the way they present, and the practices they have as a community. Of course, I liked the, the conference because they treat us very nice dinner at the Durham Castle. But also I like it, but although most of the time I couldn't understand their language, but I found one presenter uh, here, I think here, <laughs> he put my, uh, article as one of the references to back up his finding. And this is the part I found the connection across different research community. And I think that is the opportunity that we have to leverage on. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. A round of applause for Professor So. Uh, thank you. We have a minute. So <laughs> any, any questions or comments to discuss about? Sorry, because I thought that we have a one hour session, so I probably prepared too many. So giving little time for taking question and answer, but uh, you know, uh, I'm happy to stay longer and then uh, uh, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. I see that. Uh, Emmanuel, do you want to unmute? Emmanuel has a question uh, and a comment. I will read it on his behalf. Uh, thank you for your enlightening talk. As you mentioned, even negative emotions might be con uh, conducive to learning. So beyond effective state detection, how do you think we may design the delivery of e efficient, effective feedback to learners, given that the suitable balance of negative and positive emotions might differ from one learner to another? All right, so the question is, yeah, so negative emotions might be also helpful for learning. Uh, beyond effective state detection, how we think we design the delivery. Again, I think it all, always go back to uh, the, the message design, all right? Uh, I'm not talking about the feedback design based on the detection of emotions. I think what we really have to do as, as a someone uh, teaching or, or someone designing the online lectures, or online materials, make sure that the content itself is very relevant. And I found that many cases, uh, the lecturers, instructors, they cannot give up the traditional way of delivering messages. Yeah, so uh, keep talking. And also I found their video clips tend to be very long, you know? So uh, like a micro learning, you know, you know um, having some, oh, okay. Another thing uh, we try in our research lab, although I didn't include in this, uh, in this uh, talk is having a quiz in the middle of your, your uh, lecture, the online video. Yeah, and also it, it, it really helps students to, uh, feel engaged and it kind of, you know, uh, change their effective states along the way. So asking questions in the middle rather than asking questions at the end. Thank you, Professor. So I think in, in, in this, uh, thank you for sharing a very structured uh, insights about what, what we have learned and highlighting the necessity of uh, networking and collaborating with within the discipline. And uh, yeah, so with that, I think we uh, thank Professor So once again for, for her talk and make this keynote session a close. Thank you. Thank you very much.